Welcome back to our video module on dynamics. Today I'd like to explore a new problem. I'm going to imagine that we have a cart, the same cart we've had before, but now it's going to be dangling. It's going to be dangling in space and on Earth, so there's some sort of gravity and it has some sort of initial velocity and we have a linear zero length spring. And I want to know now, what is its position as a function of time? Thus far in our course, we've explored the preliminary ideas of motion, vibration, energy, and momentum. And today we're going to open up our world to two and three dimensional problems, which entail the consistent use of vectors. So let's get started. Let's start it off with our free body diagram as we start off all of these problems. And we're going to have our mass. It's going to have some spring force, force of a spring going in this direction. And then we'll also have some sort of gravity force, some force of gravity going straight down. I should note that um, this spring force is going to be at some angle theta. And maybe we could define that in our original drawing as well. Let's move on to our equations of motions. We still know that the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. However, moving to the next step requires one or two additional skills. So what is the sum of the forces? That's going to be the force of the spring plus the force of gravity. And that's going to equal mass times the acceleration. Now, of course, oh, here, these are all vectors. Because we're not dealing with x or y, but rather a combination of the two, we need to define another term. And that's going to be our position vector. We'll call that r. That's position, that's xi, plus yj, where our coordinate frame looks something like this, x and y. With that information, we know that the coordinate of the spring dictates its overall force since it has a zero rest length. That means Fs is negative Kr plus the force of gravity is always mg in the j direction. And that's going to equal mr double dot. The next step is to resolve that r vector into x and y components. Negative k xi plus yj plus mgj equals the second derivative of r dot, which fortunately for us is nice and simple. x double dot i plus y double dot j. We can use our simple trick of using a dot product to separate things into x and y components. In the x direction, we have um, negative kx equals mx double dot. This should look really familiar. And as a matter of fact, you can probably belt off the solution for this in the x direction right off the top of your head. x as a function of t is a cosine, um, we'll do square root of k over m, keep that omega out, plus b sine square root of k over mt. Very simple. In the y direction, it'll be, uh, throw us a little bit of a curveball, not too much. We get negative ky plus mg equals my double dot, the form of this solution is going to be c cosine square root of k over m t plus d sine square root of k over m t plus some constant. And in this case, the constant is negative mg over k. Let's take a brief look at how I got that. So you can see I've assumed some sort of sinusoidal combination plus some constant. I plug that into my 
equation in the y direction, I find out c equals negative g mg over k. So now we have position in the x direction as a function of time, and we have position in the y direction as a function of time. This is the brilliance of vectors that when we resolve things into their x and the y components, that we can treat them truly independently. Our final step is when we want to find position as a function of time. We simply combine our components and we get something like this. A cosine square root of k over mt plus b sine square root of k over mt i plus that whole thing again with different coefficients in the y direction. If we wanted to continue to solve for a, b, c, and d, we would use our initial conditions. What are our initial conditions? We know that v naught. Well, what are some initial conditions that I might give? We might know our initial position. x of 0 equals, we'll call it x naught. y of 0 equals y naught. We know our velocity. We could say x of 0 equals v naught sine theta, where theta was this angle. And we could say y of 0 equals v naught cosine theta and the way we've drawn it that'll actually be a negative. So the basic attack for solving this type of problem is no different than what we did in 1D. We simply have additional tools in our toolbox. There, now we're ready to solve for A, B, C, and D. Let's take a quick look at what that looks like. So we use the same solving steps that we did in 1D as 2D, we just have more tools at our disposal. We found x of 0 using the initial conditions. We found A and C right off the bat. We found then B and D plugged into our original equation, and we found position as a function of time. We should have a good feel for what that, uh, what that looks like. Let's go ahead and graph it. And in this case, we have uh, x y, and of course I didn't tell you exactly what v naught was or theta, but one can imagine that it would look something like this. We have an ellipse translated down. That has That's due to the effect of gravity on the mass. Right about here we have some v naught, and that is at some angle theta. And if we had different initial conditions, we would still end up with some sort of ellipse I'd like to point out that a form of that ellipse would be a circle. Another form of a really, really, really squished ellipse would be a straight line. So you might theoretically, let's say in green, end up with uh, something like this. Of course, it'd be offset a little bit due to gravity. So let's take a look at what happened today. We had a problem that's some sort of spring mass problem, but now we're looking in 2D. Our first step was to draw the free body diagram. Next, we went to our equations of motion. Then we used our vector notation to put the equations of motion into equation form. From there, we were able to resolve things into their x and y components. Use our initial conditions down here to identify what the uh, constants were. And then finally, we are able to write down our total solution. I should note that I made this problem intentionally simple so that we could use analytic solutions. Much of the time, we're going to need to use numerical analysis to be able to identify a problem once we've reduced to quadrature. I hope this gives you a good feel of how to use vector and vectors and vector notation with two-dimensional mass spring problems. I look forward to seeing you in our next video.